Welcome everyone. We're really glad that you joined us today. My name is Julie Garden Robinson and I'm your host for the Field of Fork webinar. This is brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. And this is the seventh year we have done the series and we have them all archived on the website. So you have probably 80 of these sorts of webinars available for watching anytime. The next slide shows our final webinar for the series and we sure hope that you join us again. Uh, next week, Karen Blakesley from Kansas State University is going to talk with us about preserving food safely. Because someday we hope that spring and summer will arrive in North Dakota. It's a very snowy day in parts of the state today. The next slide shows the webinar controls. And we've had over a thousand people attend the series this year. And we invite you to post your comments in the chat. So if you have questions for our two presenters, you can post them in the chat and we will, or I will, pose them to our presenters at the end of the session. So instead of posting your state you're from, we are certainly welcome to do that. Today, we are going to post our favorite vegetable to grow in the chat and they will have a poll so you can let us know your state. So what is your favorite vegetable to grow or fruit? All right, while you're busy doing that, the next slide provides an acknowledgement. I have a special request as usual. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. And I will ask all of you to complete a short online survey that will be emailed right after today's webinar. And as a thank you, I will provide prizes to many lucky winners of the random drawings. I'm going to wait till the end of the series to, to uh, do all the random drawings. So in the next couple of weeks, you could be a lucky recipient of something really neat. But be sure to put your complete address in the follow-up form. And don't forget to add your city, state, and zip code. And now I'm ready to welcome our speakers. I'm very pleased to introduce both of them. Our first speaker today is Anna Barr. She is a registered dietitian and the Farm to School Nutrition Field Specialist at South Dakota State University Extension. Anna combines her experiences of growing up in a farm or on a farm in Iowa and studying nutrition and horticulture at SDSU to improve local food systems and help youth get excited about nutritious foods through farm to school. And our second speaker is Londa Nowadaki in a unique joint appointment between Kansas State University and the University of Missouri, Londa serves as State Extension Food Safety Specialist for both of those states, Kansas and Missouri. She works with county and district extension agents and other stakeholders in both states to develop programming and resources in food safety, focusing on consumers, produce growers, and also farmers market vendor issues. Londa grew up on a farm in East Central South Dakota, so they're both from South Dakota in some way, and I welcome them. Thank you, Julie. And Londa and I did, um, as Julie mentioned, put together a couple poll questions and see where are we located. Mostly North Dakota. Looks like really small South Dakota. Um, <laughs> uh, Kansas, Minnesota. Okay. And then some others. Awesome. I see a lot of responses at the top of question number two. So not much experience or knowledge for farm to school. So we're happy that this is a getting started with farm to school webinar. So it looks like we're in the right, um, for the right category there. Um, but some of you have had some really neat experience. A producer has sold to schools, help organize farm to school efforts, um, have it, had kids in farm to school programs. That is, that is wonderful. So as Julie said, I'm Anna Barr. I'm the Farm to School Nutrition Field Specialist for SDSU Extension. And my portion today will be talking about getting started with Farm to School and providing kind of an overview of really what those activities are that, that categorize as Farm to School um, and show some different ways that you may be able to get involved or, or see uh, Farm to School take place in your community. 
So first of all, what is Farm to School? Farm to School changes the food purchasing and education practices of education settings in order to connect communities with fresh, healthy food from local producers. That's the definition from the National Farm to School Network. Uh, and it has three core elements. So education, local procurement, and school gardens. Oftentimes when we think about farm to school, the first thing that comes to mind is local food procurement. And that absolutely is a, is a big part of, of farm to school. Um, and that would be any way that the local foods get into school meals um, or early child care settings. Um, but it's not the only part of farm to school, right? So we also have education and that's, that's pretty much any way that kids are hands-on with nutrition, with agriculture, um, and they're learning about the local foods in their own environment. And then school gardens. So school gardens is a unique one because it provides opportunities to incorporate education in the garden space. It also provides opportunities to maybe sell the school garden produce or donate it to the school kitchen. Um, so it could kind of cross over with education and procurement. But one thing to keep in mind with farm to school is that it can incorporate any of these uh, core components, but it doesn't need to do all of them. So even just doing one of these three core elements of farm to school would make a school um, say that they're participating in, in farm to school. When we think about local procurement, so of course that's not the only element of farm to school, but it's such a big one. Um, it, local gets to be defined by the, by the farm to school program. So when we think about the United States or if we think about our own states even, there's probably hubs where quite a bit of local food production is happening in other parts of the state where it's not so much. We've got rural settings, urban settings, and so, um, the variety of different distances that schools would need to travel or define their radius in order to find local foods um, is quite different across most of these areas. Uh, so that's kind of the reason there's not a set standard definition of what local means when thinking about farm to school. Uh, but there are different examples of what schools have used. So two examples from South Dakota, Aberdeen has used the example of produced within 100 miles of their school district. Another example from Washington Springs, they say that it's any, uh, any food product that's produced in South Dakota. And again, that definition might work better for a state or a city that is in the middle of the state versus one that's on a border. Uh, and this graphic represents kind of those different region, uh, different ways to define farm to school. So this is giving Pier in the middle of South Dakota as an example. Uh, and we see on the far left, it's kind of defined as a region, a really large radius around this, the area that incorporates a multi-state area. Could define it as just the state, um, or you could go more more localized and say anything within maybe like a 30 mile radius, which might be something along the right side or within the county. Um, so there's lots of ways to define local, and that really comes down to how far out does the school need to go in order to find local produce and what's reasonable for them to choose as a local definition. Okay. So there are a lot of different examples of farm to school activities. And so my goal is to try to expand your idea of what farm to school is so that you may be able to see uh, that nearly anyone can engage in farm to school and that there are many different opportunities to um, qualify as a farm to school participating school. Uh, so I'm going to run through each slide that kind of looks like this. We'll have activities that were kind of outlined by USDA in their annual, or sorry, it's every few years they'll do a um, farm to school census questionnaire that goes out to schools uh, and kind of lists all of these different activities that they've seen happen for farm to school. So this list of activities is pretty inclusive. I think they are constantly adding to that as different programs show different ways to do farm to school, but it gives a really good idea. So this slide starts out with um, all of the federal nutrition programs. So thinking of farm to school, we think about lunch usually. But no, not to forget that there's the school breakfast program, there's the fresh fruit and vegetable program, the child and adult care food program, and oftentimes that's not happening at a school, it's happening at um, it maybe a daycare center or um, even a, a, an adult daycare center, that would be the um, child and adult care food program. So sometimes we don't think about those adult side when we're talking about farm to school, but the child care centers absolutely um, 
and then at summer meals too. So there's lots of different federal nutrition programs that you could plug into for farm to school. And a farm to school program doesn't have to involve only federal nutrition programs. It could go at sites that maybe don't operate those, but it gives kind of an idea of, we're really looking at all of the meals throughout the day and snacks. So talking about a little bit how farm to school spans the day, farm to school also spans the tray. Uh, so one meal, and this is a lunch example, but we'll always include a milk um, and a meat or a meat alternative, a grain, a fruit, a vegetable. Um, and so thinking about local foods produced in the area, those could plug into all of those different kind of portions of the tray. So uh, the canned pineapple here probably isn't a great example of a local food, but say if there are berries that are fresh in the fall or melons that are fresh, um, those absolutely could go in as a fruit component to a meal. Uh, fruits are always included in breakfast as um, federal nutrition programs require. So again, more opportunities throughout the day. Um, vegetables, Lots of fresh ones in this fall, um, thinking even uh, preserved vegetables could go in through the winter time in the spring or those root crops like potatoes or winter squashes or carrots that last a little longer can, can sometimes be a vegetable component throughout the seasons. Um, but in our northern areas, a lot of times what we have a lot of success with is the, the meat and the meat alternative portion of the tray. Um, so big beef to school programs getting started across South Dakota and North Dakota, I know. Um, and that can be really, really be a steady area for farm to school uh, in, in their climates that maybe don't have as much opportunity to grow fresh fruits and vegetables uh, throughout the school year without maybe a greenhouse. Um, and then thinking about milk also, milk is typically a local food product just by the nature of the distribution of it. Um, so, so milk could be local without even trying. It's kind of a neat thing to maybe look into. Um, and then of course, grains, not a great example in this photo. We've got the croutons, but thinking maybe of local um, rolls or something that is purchased from a local bakery could be all included as different elements of a farm to school meal. And only one would need to be incorporated at a time, right? We don't have to go all out. We can just include a little bit here and there and, and start out that way. All right, the next one, we've got examples of activities would be serving local foods as a snack in the classroom, or it could be as an a la carte item during a break period or during lunch um, for fundraisers or uh, maybe at the concession stands during sporting events. Uh, other examples would be serving local foods to pro, um, or providing farm to school activities as part of, of after school programs, serving products from school gardens or farms in any school meals, and working with local producers to develop specific food products using local foods. So I'll give some examples from South Dakota. In uh, this photo, we have um, a community garden that is located just across the street from a school in Martin, South Dakota. If you look on the right picture, you can kind of see the school there. And so um, the community garden manager would have an after school program where kids could walk across the street, engage in different activities along the garden. They could help water it, help weed it, help plant it, help harvest it, and then taste the vegetables as well. Um, and uh, there's usually a snack component that she would provide in this program, um, trying to use local foods if they're ready and fresh in the garden or bringing some in if, if, um, if they weren't available at that time, just to try to increase exposure to other local foods as well in this program. And then providing an activity. So on the right side, they beautified their garden space by painting um, floral pictures onto old records and, and hanging those along the fence of the community garden. Um, this example also hosted a community event during the first week of September. They had over 160 kids that were kindergarten through fifth grade and 20 different adults visit the garden um, as a field trip that was organized by the grade school in Martin. Uh, and at that time they got to try fresh tomatoes with salt and pepper from the garden. So um, cool ways to engage the students and even the community in some after school type programming or community events. 
And uh, that other example there was working with a local producer to develop specific products. This is an example on the right. We have Susan. She is a food service director in the southeast corner of South Dakota. Uh, she works for Lunchtime Solutions, and as a food service director, she will attend a local farmer's market and uh, get to know the producers and has since um, developing those relationships through visiting the market, started contracts with many of those producers and will sell into the school lunch program um, their local products. She also every year will host an annual crunch off with um, she participates in a, it's a national program I'll talk about in a second. Um, but finding those local sources of apples that she's able to distribute to all of her students. She's got a bigger district. It's, um, I think it's maybe around 3000 total students, uh, which is pretty large for South Dakota um, and is able to provide all apples to every single student in one day just by sourcing through her local connections that she made through a farmer's market and visiting there. Some other examples of farm to school activities holding taste tests and cooking demonstration of local or garden grown foods, promoting local foods at school, using cafeteria food coaches to promote the consumption of local foods, inviting farmers to visit the cafeteria or classroom and providing training to food service staff on farm to school or school gardens. I know in some states, we don't have this in South Dakota, but they have developed some uh, logo and promotional branding around this is a local food product or we're provided for participating in farm to school or they might have a harvest of the month program where they've um, displayed visually uh, in those meal settings what food, foods are local so um, I don't have examples of that from South Dakota but have heard of that being successful across other parts of this the country. We do have an example of is a producer visiting a school. Um, and so this uh, this producer is in the Brandon, South Dakota area near Sioux Falls, and she and her family operate a fruit and vegetable farm. And once a year, she will attend um, the school to teach students about growing uh, from planting a seed in a milk carton that they reuse from the cafeteria. And since that milk carton is biodegradable, then the students can kind of walk through the process of learning about sustainability, planting a seed, watching it grow, interacting with a um, farmer, and then also being able to take that product home and teach their parents about it. It's been a good connection for this producer then to also have that exposure of her business and her farm uh, that can that can travel to those ears of those parents that get interested in maybe touring it um, with their kids or ordering from her. What's also stemmed from this relationship is that she is now operating um, some contracts with the food service director and getting produce into the school. So um, sometimes starting with one element of farm to school can lead to others. As she started with in-class education, it stemmed into um, a local procurement deal as well. A few other examples of activities. We have Celebrate National Farm to School Month, which is in October every year conducting educational edible gardens as part of a curriculum. So any school that has a garden, if that's integrated into the curriculum somehow, oftentimes we'll see this naturally being done at the high school level with maybe a botany class or a horticulture or an FFA class. Um, but absolutely, we could we could have this happening at younger ages as well. Um, one at school in South Dakota, Wagner, South Dakota, they have the high school um, science teacher and her students will create aquaponics units and then put them into kindergarten or early um, early learners classrooms and so the high schoolers get the opportunity of kind of creating an indoor garden space and learning about the science behind aquaponics and then the the early learners get the the unit in their classroom to then um, feed the fish or uh, learn about kind of growing that that fruit or vegetable probably usually it's lettuce that gets grown in aquaponics units. Um, and they both kind of get to interact in a edible school garden that is maybe something small scale that can be inside of a classroom. So um, there are definitely opportunities if a school doesn't have a greenhouse or a high tunnel, something for all year growing, there can be little spaces of gardens in the classroom as well. Uh, 
Other activities would be student field trips to farms. So we talked about producers coming into the farm for a visit. The opposite would also be farm to school and taking students to the farm. Integrating farm to school into pre-K curriculum, right? So it's not just K through 12, we go pre-K also. And then hosting farm to school related community and family events such as a parent lunch day, a corn shucking contest, doesn't that sound fun? Um, a farmer's market at the school. We've got a few schools in South Dakota that have done that. Um, a Red Cloud Indian School is the, the main one that, that operates the farmer's market with their youth. Um, so lots of opportunities there to engage. These are some photos from a crunch off event in South Dakota. I forget the exact school, um, but they used October Farm to School Month and this crunch off event to as an opportunity to learn about um, on the top right photo there you see the seasons of an apple tree so one of their classes kind of demonstrated what an apple tree looks like throughout the year and on the bottom right corner those kind of colorful pages that are stacked on top of each other are an apple core that another class used to show all of the different components the seeds the skin the flesh um, of an apple and, and learning its different parts. So on one day in October, this crunch off event, uh, they purchased local apples and, and had at the lunchtime, um, everyone bite into it at the same time and take a photo um, and post that to the state. And so this crunch off event um, really is a local event, but it's a state by state competition. So look into it if your state provides it. I know South Dakota will be participating in this next year too, but um, you kind of register through your state and then the states will submit that data to our, our national region. And then the state with the most registered crunches uh, takes home the crunch crown. So a fun way to get involved in farm to school and a friendly competition uh, that, that even schools could consider competing against each other and doing as well. That could be a fun way to take that event and make it make it fit for your community or make it a little more competitive in your area. Um, but but that's one example of a way to celebrate farm to school month and a pretty simple event. Uh, thinking about more educational edible gardens as part of curriculum. This is at the um, Youth and Family Services in Rapid City. So they host um, Head Start and then different after school programs or day programs for, for youth and will we'll include their robust garden program as ways to teach about math and science and arts and counting the different um, petals on a flower or how many seeds go into a space or how much space do we need in between these to plant a garden and learning about math and ways and science and nutrition. Um, and so really there's lots of opportunities to use plants and local foods as part of STEAM or STEM education um, at all levels. A few other examples here um, of just getting kids outside and, and planting gardens, whether that be um, you know, we can do it during the school year. We can try the indoor stuff. We can focus our farm to school gardening efforts and the, the, see the times in spring and fall when they can be outdoors. A lot of times we'll see um, maybe some after school programs or summer programs take care of that over the summer um, uh, or really just trying to get kids outside and their hands in the dirt um, to see some of the benefits of, of just that, that fresh air and physical activity that gardening can provide. And that, like I said, those field trips to a farm. So this is an example out in Western South Dakota where, where students got to visit um, more of a commodity producer, but I believe he also did ranching and, and out there a lot of beef to school is taking place. So with that, what are the benefits? Why farm to school? Uh, these are some of the stats that have been compiled um, over the years. So I can't guarantee that each of these, these items would happen for every farm to school program, but it has been known to happen and there is data behind why farm to school. So students will see an average increase of 0.99 to 1.3 servings of fruits and vegetable, vegetables per day when, when, when at a school that participates in farm to school which then can minimize risk of diet-related diseases from a more healthy diet, uh, knowledge about gardening, about agriculture, about healthy foods, local foods, and seasonality increases because of that exposure and educational opportunity. Uh, they have a greater willingness to try new and healthy foods. 
and they choose healthier foods at school and at home. So the benefits of participating in, in farm to school at school do show to extend to home as well. Uh, and for producers, we see an average income increase of 5%. Again, don't want to say that's guaranteed, but it has been, been shown to happen. Um, and it's a greater market diversity. So a lot of schools that, that I work with in South Dakota, the, if you think about it, the school is technically the largest restaurant in town, right? They serve the most number of people every single day. So if a farmer is looking for outlets for food uh, sales, then um, a school is often a hyper local location and it's reaching a lot of, um, a lot of clients, a lot of students in their meal program. And the benefits to schools, um, we've seen average increase of 9% in meal participation in some national studies, um, lower school meal program costs. Again, don't wanna guarantee these things, but have seen that they have been true. Um, increased offerings of fruits and vegetables, greater school wellness policy adherence. Um, that could be a, a neat angle to maybe uh, get farm to school on the minds of, of certain school administrators improved food service staff morale and knowledge about local foods. Uh, educators have positive diet and lifestyle changes and a greater um, intent to integrate farm to school into the classroom. So when teachers are teaching it, they start to live it out as well. Uh, and then greater opportunities for hands-on active and experiential learning. So I want to touch base shortly here on just kind of the last couple of years with schools and seeing so much of the supply chains being disrupted and, and kind of point to that other benefit of using local foods is that um, when supply chains might be questionable, the, the local producers may be there as an opportunity to, to step in and, and having those contracts and relationships already in place is a, is a tactic for some schools to kind of mitigate those supply chain issues when they do arise. So um, it can be a bit overwhelming to a lot of food service directors and the last couple of years have been a little bit like this, um, but, but there are definite opportunities and funding sources coming out to help get local foods into schools. Uh, some positives of the COVID-19 supply chain opportunities are that USDA and state agencies are suggesting local purchases to food service directors. This is more on the minds of food service directors to be looking locally. Uh, there have been waivers and flexibilities that make local purchases easier. Uh, those um, are starting to go away for the 2022-2023 school year and a little bit back to normal. Uh, but there's still, um, from talking to kind of the state agency here in South Dakota on some food service directors, a lot of food service, um, a lot of schools are seeing uh, increased funding for farm to school and they still have some of that. So that gives them a little bit of a buffer as they go into the next year where these, um, the, the rules around nutritional quality um, and uh, uh, for the schools are kind of being a little bit more strict again, but um, definitely not eliminating the possibilities of farm to school as, as many schools still have uh, money that is directed towards uh, local purchases. Um, and then there are the negatives though. Um, currently, as far as schools go for if they have an opportunity to offer local foods, most of them are showing that they're short staffed. Uh, and so even if you have funds to purchase local foods, if those foods are less processed than the foods that they typically get off a truck, uh, then they're gonna have to spend more time preparing them in order to serve them in the meal. And, and if they don't have the people to do it, then even if they have the extra funds to purchase local foods, they might not have a way to prepare it in order to get it onto the trace, which could be a barrier um, to, to purchasing local. And, uh, and food service directors themselves, oftentimes when they're short staffed or working on the, the meal service lines or in the prep areas, so um, might not have as much time for new projects. Really quick here, the, the USDA Farm to School Census is a neat uh, example of, you can kind of find out what in your area is happening as far as farm to school. So I think Scott's gonna drop the link to this website, but I'll show you quick here. Um, if you go to the USDA Farm to School Census website, it gives an overview of the different um, stats at a national level. But if you scroll down, um, let's see. We'll explore the results, scroll past the national data, and then I'm gonna enter my zip code 
and it comes up with a few different schools. So let's do the T area school district. So you can search for your own zip code, pull this up and then start to look at the different data and see what your school has done. And maybe then that could inspire what opportunities there might be for local foods to expand um, or kind of piggyback off of some of the activities they already do. So I'll just let you know that that's here and give it as that resource to maybe poke around later. And the last two kind of big resources to share would be the USDA has um, the Office of Community Food Systems out of the Food and Nutrition Service um, branch, and they provide fact sheets along Farm to School that are applicable to all federal nutrition programs um, and have great information to look at on their website, as well as the National Farm to School Network is more of a um, nonprofit counterpart to the USDA. And um, they've got tons of resources on their website as for Farm to School as well. So two great ones to check out. Uh, and with that, um, my contact information is here, but I will turn it over to Londa to get into the food safety practices regarding Farm to School. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, so Anna, I have to tell you, while you were presenting, I'm like emailing my colleagues in Kansas saying, we got to hire somebody like Anna. <laughs> that was great. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and, and, you know, there's so many good things about farm to school. And I just love presenting after somebody like Anna, because, um, you know, she's really done a great job of just highlighting all the, the great things about farm to school. And, and so, um, uh, yeah, and it's super, and I'm, as mentioned at the beginning, I'm from South Dakota, so I love hearing about what's happening in South Dakota and just hearing about all the great stuff. So, um, so um, yes, I'm going to talk about, so I'm not, um, how do I say, um, I will, I, I'll just say this, it's on my mind. My brother up in South Dakota, he'll sometimes introduce me as like, oh, Lana's the person that tells us what not to do. <laughs> and that's not what I'm intending for this at all. Um, but I just really want to make sure that, um, you know, we, that we think about safety as well, you know, so, um, boy, I'm a huge proponent of farm to school and we just want to make sure that it's as safe as possible. So, uh, you can advance the slide, uh, to the next one here. Um, so this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Just briefly, like Anna said, there's a lot of different aspects of farm to school. Um, so we'll talk about, you know, the buying local foods part as well as school gardens. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about school salad bars, which again, Anna kind of talked about, and then just I'll share briefly some resources that are available. Um, hopefully you're all are like me and after Anna presented, you're super energized about farm to school and want to get started. So, um, so we'll have some resources that are available to help you do it safely as well. So this is my, um, so this is my big interest in farm to school. Um, so you can, you can guess those are my kids. Um, so I'll, I grew up on a farm in South Dakota and East Central around Brookings and um, my, uh, so my kids are, you know, the, I feel like, you know, they're only one generation removed from the farm and a lot of my kids' friends, I mean, they're probably, you know, maybe four or five generations removed from the farm and, and, you know, so many of those kids don't understand um, where their food is coming from and and even my kids it's like sometimes you know the things they'll say to me i think oh my goodness like i really want you to learn more about where our food comes from so um so when we go home to to grandma's house you know we uh we're out in the barn helping do chores and, and helping feed the cattle and so on um but you know i want them to to learn about farm to school all the time and um and these are kind of older pictures just fyi but um, Anna, you can go ahead and, and advance to the next slide here. I'm going to actually put in the chat, um, just a, again, an aside, I'm super excited. The school that my kids go to, our food, our school food service director is great. And she's very into farm to school. So this, um, that article that I just put in there, it was a TV, little short TV clip that was on TV just a few days ago um, in Kansas City about the school that my kids go to and the school, uh, farm to school program at my, at their school, which um, again, really makes me excited. So. Um, so, um, you know, thinking about how we can get more local foods into our school um, cafeterias, you know, to me is personally and professionally really important to me. Um, and just making sure that it's, you know, done as safely as possible. Um, you know, when you look at USDA's farm to school information, um, they really do encourage, um, you know, so it's not discouraged, it's encouraged. Um, they really encourage the use of school garden produce and, um, you know, things like shell eggs, um, you know, locally produced 
eggs in school lunchrooms. So, um, you know, so it is something that's definitely, um, you know, a great thing. Um, so the regulations vary, um, but, you know, so I'll just kind of talk about some general, um, general principles because, uh, you know, every state situation will be a little bit different, but, um, but the big thing is that a school food service authority, um, you know, they have to ensure that they're procuring food from, you know, a reputable supplier um, and one that uses food safe practices. And, you know, and sometimes how those things are enforced is a little bit different to um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But um, but, you know, there's no um, and, you know, terms like reputable supplier and food safe practices, those are kind of hard to define, I think, exactly. Um, so it's somewhat up. To, it's somewhat objective, I guess. Um, or yeah, objective. Uh, what the requirements are, sorry, subjective, it kind of, you know, kind of depends a little bit on how it's, how it's interpreted. Um, so farms, you know, if, if you're, if you're a local school buying from a farm, um, you know, it's not a requirement that the farm has um, product liability insurance, but it's certainly a good idea. Um, you know, and that's something farms can um, talk to their, uh, their normal insurance provider and, you know, make sure that they tell them, you know, we are also selling products to a local school, um, you know, just to make sure that the farmer has insurance side of things covered and, and that the school has that covered as well. Um, okay, I'll talk about produce here in a minute. So, so that was the federal level. So at the federal level, you know, it is, it's definitely allowed to be purchasing local foods, um, you know, to, to serve in your classroom or to serve in your lunchroom, sorry. Um, so state laws do vary. So again, I know we have a number of different states on the call. Um, so you'll have to check, you know, in each state exactly what the state laws are, um, you know, and I know in Kansas, in fact, I saw my friend Barb DePew is on from Kansas, and, and I don't know if any of our colleagues from Missouri are on, but, um, but you know, in Kansas, it's very much encouraged to, to have uh, local foods in schools, so, so there's no state law against it by any means. Um, local jurisdictions um, might be stricter, you know, so it just depends, you just have to check again with your local um, Food Safety Regulatory Authority to see what their um, what their requirements are. Um, so every school might have their own policies as well. And so sometimes this is a matter of um, you know whoever whatever group it might be. You know if it's uh, if you work in Extension or if you work in you know whatever group you're working with. You know just working with the local school and talking to them about their policies and talking to them about their um, you know, their, their willingness to, to purchase local foods. Um, and, uh, you know, so sometimes the school might kind of have a blanket statement of all produce has to be GAP certified or whatever it might be. And, and um, you know, might just need to talk to them about, you know, really what are, how are we going to ensure that our food is safe, but also help promote having more local food in the schools, um, you know, how to balance that out. So, um, and I'm covering up, oh, so liability coverage for farmers. Um, so that's just to say, you know, again, schools might say, might require that the farmer has a product liability um, insurance um, if they're purchasing from them. And again, the farmer can then visit with their local, um, their, their regular insurance provider to see, um, you know, how much additional charge that would be. Sometimes it's not that much additional charge on your, on your insurance premiums to do that. So, okay, go ahead to the next slide. All right, so um, I'm going to talk now. I'm going to talk specifically about produce, the regulations for produce. So um, this is um, so as Anna mentioned, you know, um, different states will have different levels of local produce available during the school year. Um, you know, because September or August through um, May, you know, there's not always a lot of local produce, but but you know, in some cases there are. You can always buy apples and things like that. Um, but so the um, and then of course there's summer feeding programs like she talked about too, but. Anyway, the local, um, so the produce regulations specifically for produce, there's a Food Safety Modernization Act. That's what FSMA stands for. Um, there are produce safety rules within that. Um, so farms that are, um, that have annual produce sales of, you know, uh, basically less than $25,000 are exempt from needing to meet the requirements of FSMA. Um, and then uh, produce that's really consumed raw, like potatoes would also be exempt. Um, and then there's also some local kind of like a well, local foods exemption for sales that are, you know, in the same state. And there's kind of some other caveats to that too. But, 
but so there's there's definitely some exemptions from this needing to meet FISMA requirements and needing to meet FISMA requirements um, you know is is not that difficult so produce growers can meet those requirements but um, but you know if they're selling less than twenty five thousand dollars and they don't have to um, FISMA there's no extra auditing costs or things like that so it's just that the farmers need to meet the you know the safety practices um, and then and get inspected so. Um, hopefully your local extension um, in each of your states can can help you with that. I know Julie um, helps with produce safety trainings in North Dakota, for example, and, and you know, a lot of our extension colleagues around the uh, around the um, uh, the region definitely do a lot of um, produce safety trainings to help produce growers to meet the requirements. So so that shouldn't be a, an issue. Um, you can go to the next slide. So. Um, you know, if you're a school considering buying local produce, or if you're, you know, working with a school that's considering buying more local local foods, I'll say not just local produce, uh, but for local produce, um, you know, you could require that the growers be GAP certified. Um, you know, from my perspective, that shouldn't be a requirement, but it but it's something that every school could determine they want to do. Um, so. And I won't go into a lot of details about GAP certification, but it's it's basically an audit that is done, and then the farmer has to pay for that audit. So it's an extra expense for the farmer. Um, so maybe you know you could also just require if you're again a local school could require that um, produce growers attend some trainings and have some sort of certification, maybe not GAP certification, but have some sort of way for you to know that okay, this food is going to be safe that we're going to be serving to our kids. So. Um, other things that you can do as a, that schools can do, um, and this would be for any sort of, of food, not just produce, but, you know, just some current vendors, you might, you know, uh, kind of those broadline distributors might already be purchasing local um, foods. So um, like Anna talked about milk, for example. So, you know, you can, um, you can check with your regular distributors and, and just, you know, ask for that you preferentially would like to buy locally as well. That's another option that you could look at. Um, so one thing that is always important, again, just to think about um, traceability purposes is to know, just to keep records, um, that the school would keep records of where they're getting their, um, their food from, um, you know, to know where it came from and then, you know, where it's been distributed to, if it went to this elementary school or that elementary school, um, that it's, you know, you're keeping track of that. Um, you know, having just having records is always an important thing to make sure that we're tracing if there are any issues that come up. Um, purchasing from something like a local FFA chapter is also, you know, a great practice. You know, sometimes like FFA chapters might have a greenhouse or something like that, or they might have some sort of um, food production um, that they're doing. Um, so then you could also just make sure that you're keeping that information from them that's written there above, just that purchase date, the name of vendor, your cost, you know, how much you're, um, how much you're purchasing from them, just to know that, just to know that your bases are covered of, you know, okay, on Tuesday, we served, um, you know, strawberries that were from um, the local FFA chapter. And, you know, hopefully there'll be no problems with it. But if there ever were, then you would know, you know, where that produce came from that day and be able to trace back any issues and, and be able to, to help prevent that from happening in the future. So, um, okay, so you can advance to the next slide. So again, thinking of other things that schools can do um, to reduce their risks um, if they do wanna purchase um, locally. Um, uh, this is kind of more on the produce side, but again, um, this would apply to other products as well. <laughs> there are some on-farm checklists and guides available. I'll, I'll um, show those here in a minute. Um, there's a number of different sources available for those sort of checklists. Um, different extension services, again, across the U.S. have those. Um, USDA, Iowa State has a good one I'll show in a minute. Um, so schools can also do their own auditing. I know like my kids' is local school, they do go out to um, the local produce farmer that they buy produce from. And, and um, you know, and she visits him and makes, you know, just Kind of looks around and sees what uh, you know, sees what sort of production practices he's using, and so on. So, um, so that's also a, a good practice. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide, please. So here's this checklist that I mentioned from um, Iowa State, and I think at the towards the end of my presentation, I'll have a link to this um, where you can find it on their website, um, and then maybe Scott could put it in the chat for us. But but I'll I'll have that here in a minute. 
Um, but so this checklist is just a great way to kind of, you know, if you were helping a school to go to visit a local farm and think about um, the things that they to be looking for to make sure that that, you know, produce is going to be as safe as possible. Um, here's some good things to, to look at and to kind of think through, um, you know, how we can reduce that risk as much as possible. Um, so, okay, you can go to the next slide. So um, again, um, you know, I've kind of mentioned this already, but just visiting the farm, observing their practices, and this would be produce or any other product that you might be buying from a local farmer, um, you know, just developing that strong relationship, um, again, like Anna talked about, is, is really helpful. Um, and then, you know, just inspecting incoming product, just like you would with any incoming product, you know, when schools are receiving their products, they want to make sure that they are um, safe and that they've been handled properly, that the transportation of those products is also safe. Um, you know, I grew up on a farm and I know that farmers carry all sorts of things in the back of their pickups. And so, uh, you know, we want to make sure that the pickup wasn't just used to haul sheep and then they use it to haul watermelons <laughs> the next day and they did it clean out the back of the pickup, you know, so you just want to make sure that, um, that things are being done in a safe manner, you know, through the whole process as much as possible. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. So, okay, yeah, here I talk about uh, transportation. So, um, so this is the example that I just talked about with transportation of in the back of the pickup there. Um, but, you know, again, just thinking about um, the time it takes for transportation of the product, whether it's eggs or whether it's beef or whether it's produce, you know, um, that the school is getting from the, from the producer, that it's all, um, you know, being done in a, in a reasonable short amount of time so that the products aren't getting above into that temperature danger zone of 40 to 140 degrees for more than two hours um, is the key. We want to make sure that things are kept as cold as possible. Um, and then just thinking again about, um, you know, purchasing and deliveries, you know, just, just inspecting the local, the products that are coming in again, um, and like Anna talked about, you know, if you are buying um, whole carrots instead of buying um, already shredded carrots or whatever, um, you know, then, then there's the school is going to have to have an extra step of um, just making sure that they are washing the produce. And, and um, if, again, if they are going to be chopping it or cutting it, peeling it, um, that it is refrigerated within two hours of that happening. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So um, then just then, like Anna talked about, school gardens is another great way um, for kids to learn about how food is grown and, and where food comes from and that it doesn't just come from the store. Um, so just basic things to think about. We have a, I have a publication there on the bottom that goes into, you know, it's like four pages. It's, it's relatively short, but it goes into a lot more detail about, um, thank you, Scott. It goes into a lot more detail of, of um, you know, what you should be looking for um, in a school garden. But but these are the basic things, you know, the water source, um, composting or, or using soil amendments, you know, manure safely. Um, and then, you know, working with the school grounds crew, keeping animals out of the garden. That's not easy, of course, but, um, you know, doing the best that you can to keep, um, keep animals out as much as possible because it reduces the yield and it also obviously can um, compromise food safety. Um, and then thinking about when you're harvesting, you know, doing that in a safe manner as possible. Um, and then again, like I mentioned before, storing that garden produce, you know, if, if their school garden is producing lettuce or whatever it might be, um, that it's stored, um, you know, separately from the lettuce that you might be getting from another farmer or from your mainline distributor, um, so that you do know, you know, if there ever was a problem, you would know which, um, which pro problem the product was from. I will say, um, I just, I remember very well, one of the first times I knew that our, my kids' school um, had a good farm to school program was, um, I happened to hear from the school of food, the school that they didn't, like, I think my daughter, my oldest was a kindergartner. And um, that was back in, you know, whatever year that was, that there was a big lettuce recall around Thanksgiving um, from uh, California, maybe 2019 or 2018. I don't remember, but anyway, um, our kids at school was still serving lettuce. And I remember thinking like, Oh, interesting. And she said, yeah, we're buying locally. So we're not affected by that big recall. So they actually had, you know, lettuce available at the school. So, um, so anyway, sometimes, you know, again, like Anna talked about having that local source, 
um, can protect you from if there's recalls of a national source and can protect you from that supply chain uh, bottlenecks of using a national source as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so school salad bars, um, again, this is kind of the, um, you know, the same, um, same principle as just using the produce, you know, on the plate, but just in a little bit different way. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, this, this website gives more information about salad bars, which is a great way to get more local produce into your, um, into the menu. Again, with any salad bar, you want to make sure that it's kept below 40 or 41, um, make sure that there's tongs so that the kids aren't grabbing things with their hands and just keeping it clean. But this is a great way to, um, provide that, uh, local produce. Um, and like Anna mentioned, like a harvest of the month type of program and, you know, labeling that produce so kids know this is from a local farm, you know, is a great way for kids to learn more about where their food comes from. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's um, towards the end here, um, just some resources that are available. So this is some great websites of um, from USDA and then there's one from Iowa State that I showed earlier. Um, so you can take a look at those resources and find, um, just find some, some good resources. If you are, you know, if your local school is, oh, thank you. I, um, I'll check on that website too. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so you can see, um, you know, how, what, what things schools can look at to make sure that they're getting the safest product and possible. Okay. You can go to the next slide. All right. Great. So um, yeah, and you can go to the next. So this is just pictures of my kids and, and thinking about the garden in our backyard and how much they learn from the garden is a great experience for them to learn more. So um, here's my contact information with some, um, some of our other resources that we have available too. So, um, and with that, we're really happy to take questions if anybody has, um, has any questions for, for Anna or myself. Well, thank you, Anna and Londa. That's a lot of great information. Please type any questions you have in the chat. Julie, I see Claire up at the top had asked Anna about the statistics. Oh. Um, it says, can you share those, especially the school one? I don't know if maybe Anna's just, or maybe Claire's wondering about having the slides or I'm not sure. I just was did see that one come up. Oh, okay. Um, I can share. Um... Maybe I can find it now too. I can maybe stop sharing my screen. And um, it, a lot of those came from the National Farm to School Network and they have a nice PDF. Um, it's, I think it's three or four pages that walks through a lot of those stats and shows the original source for that data. So I'll try to find that um, right now and put it in the chat. And just so everyone knows, they did provide their, their PowerPoint as a PDF. So that will be on the Field to Fork resources. So you will all have access if you want to see more clearly, um, you know, take a closer look and study. I did pop in the chat uh, the survey that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, you can do that anytime now or when you get the link, which usually comes out the day after. And that is connected to a random drawing survey so you would have chances to win prizes as well as a little thank you. So Jennifer is raising her hand, chat. Um, Scott, could you give her permission to talk? Yep, just did. Hello. Okay. Um, so I would really like to do this in my schools. And sadly, I have been kind of half listening and half preparing for a thing that I have to leave for. Mm like almost now. Um, so I was just wanting contact info and just to say that you guys have really inspired me. I'm super excited about this. I think this is something I can make happen in my area. Um, I need to like baby step be kind of like waded into the pool. And I love that idea of the crunch thing in October. I think that might be like a kind of a, you know, what they call it, zero gravity entry or whatever, zero clearance entry, like toe in the water um, thing. So I, I appreciate those different examples. And I would, I think I'm going to need to watch this again and reach out to you guys, um, when I have questions. Cause, and I really appreciate Londa, you being on here as well, because I can hear all of the things in the back of background of like, we can't do that. That's not something we've ever done before. This is different. <laughs> and anytime something is different, there's always, you know, liability, we're going to get sued. So, you know, there's some bad, terrible, awful thing can happen. So I'm glad that you covered some of that and that are available to answer that when it comes up. 
Well, very good. As I said, you'll be able to um, see all the PowerPoint slides and I think both of our speakers had their contact information at the end of their talks or the beginning. I don't remember which. Yeah, and if anyone from a different state, um, I can try to help connect you with who your lead is for your state too that might have more of that specific information um, if you reach out and I can maybe direct you other places too. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm here in Missouri. Okay, yeah. yeah. So Rhonda has a question and it's to Anna. Can a non-farmer donate excess vegetables to schools? And Londa, you can follow up. If a school will take excess vegetables, what documentation of growing procedures should be submitted with the vegetables since a backyard gardener wouldn't do gap? I think I might let Londa tackle the, the all of the liability and everything that's um, embedded in this type of question. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm happy to chat about it. Um, so, so I, when I was talking about like being gap certified, that was just something I was saying, that's just a suggestion. I mean, like I would not, um, it's really up to each school, what their requirements are. And, um, it's really, you know, and unfortunately it's kind of state by state dependent on exactly what your rules are locally. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, there's, I think it's fine for schools to accept, um, excess vegetables. I mean, it's, um, you know, if, if I was, so if I was a school food service manager or if, or if I'm, my kids are going to a school, um, you know, I would want the school food service manager to, you know, to think through like, okay, what risks are there involved? Like, you know, I, I probably wouldn't, I would probably discourage schools from taking like lettuce from a local garden, from a, just a local gardener, or maybe even strawberries. Those are higher risk foods, but you know, things like maybe apples or something like that, you know, those are, um, you know, those are grown higher above the ground, you know, they're lower risk. Um, you know, I, I think that would be okay. It's definitely, um, and I see it's three o'clock, so I'll stop rambling, but you know, it's definitely really up to the local level, exactly what they want to do. Um, so there's really, you know, so like there's really no, uh, one size fits all rule, like, yes, a local gardener can, or yes, or no, a local gardener cannot donate excess vegetables to the school. Um, it's really a matter of you talking to the local school to see what they say. Um, and, and again, I would say that, you know, it's okay. Um, but just to make sure that, um, you know, I mean, encourage the gardener to use safe practices, encourage them to attend some extension trainings. You know, we have lots of stuff available online, you know, just to make sure people are doing it as safely as possible. Oh, very good. Well, I'm going to draw us to a close because we do try to stay within an hour. Uh, you will have contact information for both of our speakers and I certainly thank them for sharing their expertise today and I'm inspired too. So thank, thank you to both of you for this. I hope that many of you will join us for our last session. And if you missed any of the previous ones, please go and check out that archive. There's a link right above that Scott put in, um, I believe. So check, check out all of that other information. We have a lot of handouts and a lot of other resources. So thanks again, and thanks to everyone for being here. Mm -hmm.